Good morning. Good morning, everybody. I see folks from Florida. Destin, glad you have power back on. And I saw the shout out y'all from Mississippi. So hi, everybody. My name is Dan Burke. I'm a vice president of the Pacific Dental Services Foundation, whose mission includes, among other things, the promotion and advocacy of oral systemic health, especially for nations elderly and those with systemic conditions uh, which conditions have been linked uh, to oral health. I'm also the Chief Enterprise Strategy Officer of Pacific Dental Services, so that's me. And I'm gonna moderate today, I'm excited about it. So uh, before we begin and I introduce our panelists, which I think you'll all agree are pretty remarkable folks, uh, I've been asked to go over some things to assure you that if you're watching right now and following instructions, you will receive CE credit today. So go ahead, turn up your volume, hopefully have a little bit of fun uh, and, uh, and get your CE. So if this is your first webinar with CE Zoom, we do have some rules to follow. Uh, this is an hour and a half presentation, so you must stay on for one hour and 15 minutes to receive credit. So please make sure you stay on for at least an hour and 15. The last 15 will likely be Q&A, so hopefully uh, that will be compelling as well. At the end of the webinar, during the Q&A, uh, CE Zoom will put up a verification code. Uh, once you have that verification code, please log into your CE Zoom account by going to cezoom.com. So all this will be there, so don't worry about it. Uh, but that's where you'll scroll down, you'll find today's course, you'll click on the green button, that'll verify, and you'll put in that code uh, that CE Zoom pops up during Q&A. So again, the code will come at the end, you'll pop it in at cezoom.com, and away you go. So. Um, uh, by the way, I've been told, please do not ask for the code before the presenters are done speaking. It's distracting to the audience and the speakers. So I, I think we all get it. The code's coming at the end. And because we are administering a live stream webinar, it requires a decent internet connection. So if by chance you get dropped uh, from your connection, you can't see or hear the speaker, just hit reconnect up the top. There's a button that says reconnect. And hopefully that'll work. If not, you might just have to get out and come into a different browser or change the device you walk watching from uh, to get you back on. Regarding chat box, so I see a ton of you are seeing the chat box, which is great. Uh, in some webinars, you have to actually do a chat so they verify you're there. You do not have to do that. So don't feel you need to chat to get credit for anything. Uh, just, just chat box for comments and questions, which would be great. We'll be monitoring those. And at the end, uh, however many questions we can get to, we will sure try. So uh, appreciate that. Uh, so. In any case, let's uh, let's kick it off with uh, first. Uh, before I introduce the speakers, uh, even I just need to say thank you to Crest Oral B and Procter and Gamble. Uh, this, of course, is their platform, uh, and they are promoting oral systemic health, uh, which is terrific in the mental in the uh, medical dental medical integration. Uh, really appreciate it. Crest Oral B and Procter and Gamble uh, have really been at the forefront among industry leaders promoting oral systemic health. Uh, quite recently, I think a lot of you have probably seen the hashtag dental ER, which uh, tried to communicate to patients, hey, if you have a dental emergency during COVID, please don't go to the emergency departments. They're, they're, that's, that's not the best use of their capacity and really not where you wanna go. You wanna go find a dentist who can treat emergencies. And now the dental safety campaign, uh, Crest, Oral-B, Procter & Gamble have been founding members of that, along with groups like uh, Dent Supply Serona and Vista and thousands of dentists and groups. So I uh, really appreciate Crest Oral-B's uh, not just lip service, but actually commitment and uh, energy uh, for those important causes which benefit not just dentistry, but certainly uh, uh, patients out there, which is really uh, what we're all about. Also thank Jed Ivey, uh, those of you who have been on uh, these before know he's a rock star. I promised I wouldn't say he's sitting in his basement, uh, so I won't. So there you go, Jed, didn't say it. And also Sarah Thiel from CE Zoom, thanks so much. So without further ado, let's get to the panelists. Uh, I think you'll agree they're a remarkable group. Uh, the first is Dr. Jack Dillenberg, who has many titles. Uh, he is Dean Dillenberg. He's the founding dean of the Arizona uh, School of Dentistry and Oral Health, as you likely know, and he's held numerous public health leadership positions in Arizona, California, and nationally. Quite interesting, he uh, just less than a month ago, Dean Dillenberg, I think, he was just elected mayor of Jerome, Arizona, adding to his resume. And for those of you uh, who, have, who know Jack, for decades, he's been one of the great visionaries in the dental profession uh, and, and a passionate ad, uh, advocate for access to oral health and uh, just a remarkable human being. So that's Jack. Uh, next, we have Dr. Judith Haber. 
Uh, Dr. Haber is the Ursula Springer Leadership Professor in Nursing at NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing. She's the Executive Director of a national nursing oral health initiative called the Oral Health Nursing Education Practice, ONEP uh, program. It's funded by DentiQuest and Arcora Foundations. Dr. Haber is also a board member of the Santa Fe Group, hope to hear a little bit more about that, and is the lead author of the 2015 AGPH publication, Putting the Mouth Back in the Head. And in 2019, ONEP received an American Academy of Nursing Edge Runner Award as a visionary and innovative program. And uh, Judy is also, I know, is a passionate advocate for the inclusion of a dental benefit in Medicare for our nation's elderly, something that... Um, for some is, is uh, remarkable that it's not included. So thank you, uh, Judy, for that. Uh, next, we'll have Dr. Erin Hartnett. She is also at NYU. She's the program director for the NYU Rory Myers College of Nursing's oral health programs. Uh, and those programs are the Oral Health Nursing Education and Practice, ONA, and the Teaching Oral Systemic Health, which is called TOSH. Dr. Hartnett received, developed a national interprofessional oral health nursing curriculum, and she's coordinated many oral health interprofessional experiences with NYU nursing, medical, and dental schools. She's developed oral health education programs for the National League of Nursing and the Nurse, Nurse Family Partnership, and published numerous articles on oral health and links to overall health. And uh, last but not least, who uh, she'll be kicking off our presentation, someone who may be known to many of you, as she's been a frequent speaker on this platform, is Ann Rice. Ann has been a dental hygienist for over 30 years and focuses on oral systemic health and currently the prevention of dementia. In fact, I would say she's one of our nation's leading uh, experts on the subject. So thank you, Ann, for that. Uh, she writes for several dental magazines and three years ago started her own company called Oral Systemic Seminars which educate colleagues and the general public through coaching and speaking. She's also a fellow at the American Academy of Oral Systemic Health, and she's a certified dementia practitioner and is a graduate of the Bail Donine Preceptorship for Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and Healthcare Providers. So thank you all. Panelists, I know you have a lot of demands on your time. We really appreciate you coming on this uh, important topic. So we're going to kick it right off, Anne. Uh, to help us set the table and level set on oral systemic health, really uh, not to take it for granted, but what are we all talking about uh, with oral systemic health and, uh, uh, and perhaps some of the examples of that, if you could kick us off, Anne would appreciate it. Sure. Well, oral systemic health um, is not new. Matter of fact, the Academy, the American Academy for Oral Systemic Health has been around for over a decade. So I don't think that you can go to conferences and you can find continuing ed everywhere, right, about this connection between the mouth and the body. Most often, I think we really think about the pathogens and the bacteria getting into the system, but it's, it goes both directions. If you look inside the oral cavity, we can see lots of different things that are leading to systemic problems. We can see anemia and autoimmune diseases. So it's both when we talk about oral systemic health it leads one direction and then it leads to the next. I think that most of us understand this link between cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and the pathogens in the mouth. If, in fact, 80% of American adults have some sort of gum inflammation, this is such a trigger for what we'll talk about in a minute is inflammation. And our experts today are going to talk more about cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Um, we know that we're finding bacteria in brain tissue, of course, in vessel, uh, vessel health, um, causing damage. So oral systemic isn't new. This isn't presumptuous that we're putting these, these pieces together. There's thousands of, of scientific studies linking both of these together. Um, inflammation is probably the key, the root cause of all chronic diseases and with periodontal disease, Chronic inflammation, that's what it is every day, all day, and that's where the problems arise. Really, the single pathway to aging is inflammation. Um, it gets the response of our immune cell cells going on hyperdrive, causing damage to blood vessels and, and all of our systems. You can see, and as I said, the medical experts are going to get into this a little bit more, but how periodontal disease affects, this is for cardiovascular disease, the blood vessels. So the bacteria getting into the vessel walls, this inflammatory response. So these mediators, C-reactive protein, um, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and then that all comes around and it's a vicious cycle and it keeps going over and over. Something that I found that was very interesting is something about LP plaque 2. 
um, which really increases plaque vulnerability in cardiovascular disease. And periodontal disease is the only known disease that increases this LP plaque too. Diabetes, the exact same thing, the bacteria, the inflammatory markers, periodontal disease gets taken in, then we have A1C issues. And we know that if you can help with periodontal disease, you can help with diabetes as well. In the dental practice, we have clinicians that are all about oral systemic health. They want to reach out to other providers. They want to go into healthcare. We're looking for um, oral cancer. We're looking at heart issues. We're looking at sleep disordered breathing with simple assessments in our practice. And, and we want to bridge this relationship. It's one body. We just talked about that. So bridging that with all of healthcare, anyone that's dealing with a patient, it makes perfect sense. This is my favorite to talk about, obviously, is brain health, dementia, and the impact that I think that dental providers have um, to help drive down the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease um, and vascular dementia, as well as a, a couple of others. Um, we, in our dental chair, how this all kind of started for me is I realized that increasing your risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia has lots of factors. When I broke them down, they were things that I assessed for in my dental chair. And when we talk about brain health, we're also talking about heart health. All of this goes together as one system, obviously. So we're taking blood pressure. We're looking at cholesterol. We are doing nutritional counseling for our patients, aren't we? We're treating periodontal disease and we're assessing for sleep that are all risk factors for Alzheimer's disease. The study for this amyloid plaque with Alzheimer's disease is over 35 years old with hundreds of billions of dollars of research. This, the crux is this. Basically, these plaques kill synapses. That, in turn, kills neurons. Then the amyloid is this neuroprotective. So you get this insult in your brain, and these amyloids lay down, and in a healthy brain, it gets cleared out. In an unhealthy brain... Um, that's where the problem is. And so there's a new hypothesis talking about an innate immune protection hypothesis. And that's where what we do clinically in dentistry with bacteria, yeast, and the herpes virus specifically to say that uh, certain bacteria has a causal relationship. Let's not do that with Alzheimer's disease, but we do know a relationship. Porphyromonas gingivalis, which is a high-risk pathogen, we look at spirochetes, a certain Treponemia denticola, which is specific to periodontal disease, has been studied for three decades by a Dr. Judith McGlossy, which is probably the biggest uh, causal relationship that they might be getting to. Yeast with our patients, we see it with our diabetic patients, right, every single day, even in their appliances. We know that this yeast crosses the blood-brain barrier as well. And HSV-1, cold sores, we have so much in our arsenal, in our practices, between low laser light therapy, we can give prescriptions. Um, There's so many things that we can do to help drive down the replication of the herpes virus that's implicated. This is from a presentation that I do that I think it's the wedding gift of the future that you give a blood pressure cuff because I think that instills for overall health and wellness of the couple. Blood pressure is something that we do every single day in our practices. Um, we can really keep a handle on patients' blood pressure where they may not see their physician but once a year and keeping that um, list and letting our patients know and then getting that information to other healthcare providers. With Alzheimer's disease, high blood pressure in midlife, you double your risk by a sprint mind trial. And then there was another trial, uh, there's another study that came out, and for women, two thirds of the cases of Alzheimer's disease is women. And we know that midlife high blood pressure increases their risk of dementia by 70%. So you as a dental provider, getting this information and then feeding this out to their healthcare providers is, is of great importance. And then another thing in dentistry where we can get this information out to other providers is sleep. Quick, simple, simple sleep assessments, then leading to a sleep study. We know that sleep is such a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So obviously dementia is my favorite thing to talk about, but this is all about how we can utilize what we do in each of our individual lives and bringing all that together. The mouth is attached to the body and all of us as clinicians, all of us out there in healthcare need to work together because it's one body. Does that answer you, Dan? 
I think that's great. <laughs> that was a lot. I'm like, wow, I'm taking notes. So uh, that was terrific. Thank you, Anne. And uh, Dr. Hartnett, uh, uh, of NYU. Um, could you share with us some of the other more common conditions that are associated with oral systemic health? Uh, Hello, thank you. Well, Ian, thank you so much for pointing out all of those oral systemic interactions, especially in adults and older adults. Those oral microorganisms, especially the pathogenic bacteria of periodontitis and the inflammatory markers, also play a role in pregnancy. Pregnancy is a time when the increase in the hormones causes many changes in the gingiva, which are linked to periodontal disease. The periodontal disease actually affects anywhere from 20 to 50% of pregnant women. And although there's not a cause and effect, there is a relationship between periodontal disease and preterm birth and low birth weight. And it is thought to be related to the increase in the inflammatory markers that, that you had mentioned, Anne. Yet many pregnant women never see a dentist. One study uh, that was done by Cigna in 2015 found that 76% of pregnant women in their study reported having a dental problem, yet only 56% actually saw a dentist. There are many barriers to dental care in pregnancy, and one is a lack of informed pregnancy providers. The pregnancy providers are not telling their patients to go for dental care and how important it is. So this results in uninformed patients, and often many of these patients either lack dental insurance or can't find a Medicaid provider. So these are all important issues during pregnancy for the oral systemic connection. But another one is that pregnant women who have dental caries really need to have these dental caries treated while they're pregnant because mothers with dental caries have an increased incidence of children with dental caries, three times more likely to have children with dental caries after the child is born due to the vertical transmission of the bacteria from the mom to the baby. So this is one of the causes of um, early childhood caries. So early childhood caries is another oral systemic infection. This is a chronic, the most chronic infectious disease of childhood, five times more common than asthma, 10% to 20% of children in poverty have serious early childhood caries. And often people used to think, well, these teeth are gonna fall out anyway, but now we realize that a child with tooth decay, this affects the whole child. It affects their ability to sleep, eat, learn, speak, socialize, which results in poor nutrition, poor growth and development, poor education and poor general well-being. So early childhood caries is something that <clears throat> our medical and dental providers need to be very, very much on top of. Another very important oral systemic infection is HPV, the human papillomavirus. This is the most common sexually transmitted infection. 80% of adults have had an H HPV infection, the leading cause of oral cancer, and 70% of oral pharyngeal cancer is caused by HPV. Now, previously, we used to find oral cancers in older males who used tobacco and alcohol, but today we're seeing this in a much younger population now. And a lot of it is non-smoking males, age 35 to 55. So what um, we are really promoting is the HPV vaccine because that vaccine was developed in 2006 and it has decreased the teenage girls' incidence of HPV 56% in the anogenital infections. So this year, on June 12, 2020, 
the FDA approved the use of Gardasil, Gardasil 9, and HPV vaccine to prevent oropharyngeal and head and neck cancer. So this is an approval under an accelerated basis, and a clinical trial is underway to verify the clinical benefit. But for right now, all healthcare providers need to promote this vaccine from age 9 to 14, two shots, six months apart. After age 15 to age 45, three shots, two months apart. And hopefully it will have the same impact on oral cancer as it has on anogenital cancer. The next um, condition that is uh, <clears throat> a very important bidirectional autoimmune disease is celiac disease. The mouth is a direct route to the digestive system, and it's often an early warning for celiac disease. Many people go undiagnosed with celiac for years, even decades, with vague complaints that are missed. And often the signs are right there in their mouth. Problems with dental enamel, delayed or missing teeth, lichen planus, chelosis, atrophic lositis, burning mouth syndrome, and up to 46% of celiac patients have aptus ulcers. The mechanism is still obscure, but there is some relationship maybe between the oral ecosystem and the saliva, the leukocytes, the microbiome, but usually patients, once they get on a gluten-free diet, these issues can, many of them can resolve. So there is a very important role for oral systemic health in a celiac disease. So those are just a few I wanted to mention, and um, I think that's, that's it. That's great. Right okay. Thanks, Dr. Harnett. Really appreciate it. So um, we all recognize as well that, that we're experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, and it seems to be impacting nearly every aspect of our life, and it, it certainly impacts oral systemic health, uh, and that's what we're seeing. Uh, in addition to conditions such as diabetes, lupus, cardiovascular disease, and others, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Hart and, and Anne, uh, for walking through some of them. There's recently been a flurry of articles and studies connecting periodontal disease to some of the more extreme reactions to COVID-19 infection. Um, there's been articles in the British Dental Journal uh, by Dr. Sampson and her team. The Journal of, of the California Dental Association has an article online that'll be in print uh, in, our, in our October issue uh, and others. So uh, with all of that coming out, uh, I'll, I'll turn to you, Dr. Haber. Does that surprise you that there would be a connection between you know, diseases of the mouth and infections of the mouth and COVID-19 uh, reactions? We can hear you. Can yeah. you hear me? Okay. Um, you know, it's not surprising at all because we know that gum disease, periodontal disease, periodontitis, increases risk for many of the conditions that Anne um, in particular spoke about earlier, four times increase in the risk of stroke, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, respiratory diseases like pneumonia, and other autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and many others, celiac being another one, usually in young children, but not necessarily. Today, it's more rampant in adults than ever before, or identified, I should say. Anyway, the accumulation of bacteria in the oral cavity is really one of the keys to the connection between the severity of COVID-19 and the mouth or the oral systemic connection. So whether it uh, originates, the problem originates or the contribution of the mouth originates with tooth decay, an accumulation of calculus, plaque, 
uh, inflammation and infection in the gums related to gingivitis or periodontal disease, or just plain old poor oral hygiene. This increases the risk for the most severe and often mortality causing complication of COVID-19, which is pneumonia. So as you can see um, from the slide, it really all begins with the oral microbiome. If you think of bacteria like P. gingivalis or P. nucleatum in the oral biofilm, um, this travels from the mouth down the trachea to the lungs. And in the lungs, um, the aspiration process kind of disseminates through the lungs to the epithelial tissue. And the periodontal disease enzymes, TNF, IL-6, IL-8, or others, alter the mucosal surfaces of the lungs to allow the adhesion of these oral pathogens to the respiratory epithelium, which is really its skin. Um, these are the same inflammatory markers that are already heightened by the COVID-19 infection. So what happens is the respiratory epithelium altered by these periodontal cytokines, which are inflammatory, and we know that one of the big problems with severity of COVID-19 is the cytokine storm. The oral pathogens that lodge in the epithelium of the lungs and alter it contribute to this inflammatory response, contributing to the cytokine storm that is associated with the severe COVID-19 um, condition and the coronavirus pneumonia, which is the most dangerous complication for people with underlying conditions, especially like those with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, history of hypertension, and carries a high mortality rate. Basically, the bottom line is that people who have poor oral hygiene to begin with, who have untreated tooth decay and or periodontal disease, are at high risk for the secondary infections associated with COVID-19 that can lead to death. And so we need to take the mouth very seriously. Uh, just a couple of words about decreasing the risk for COVID-19 related pneumonia. Because overall pneumonia is the leading cause of death in people age 70 or above. Um, Non-ventilator hospital acquired pneumonia, fondly called NVHAP, is the most common hospital acquired infection. And there is a lot of evidence um, across disciplines that support that oral hygiene protocols can reduce NVHAP pneumonia by 50% or more, which in turn could reduce the risk for COVID-19 complications from related comorbid bacterial or viral infections and contribute to decreasing risk for a cytokine storm. So there is evidence that supports that the systematic use of oral hygiene protocols reduces the risk for pneumonia, for COVID-19 the chief COVID-19 complication. And this is true whether a patient is on a ventilator or not, or is at home healthy or not. Whether they are at home and it's the precursor of, or the early stages of, or they're in the hospital but not on a vent, or then in the ICU and on a ventilator. Oral hygiene, mouth care, as we call it in nursing historically, is essential. Another interesting fact, just quickly, is that tongue ulcers have recently been identified as an early symptom of COVID-19 infection or co-infection. And again, this is due to um, immune and um, inflammation dysregulation. And they have found that there is a high expression of angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE2 
in the epithelial cells of the tongue. And approximately 54% of patients may develop tongue ulcers within five days after they were tested for COVID-19 and turn up positive. The good news is they disappear within one to two weeks and benefit from the use of a chlorhexidine mouthwash. So a word to the wise, promote oral hygiene. It is a winner. Sounds simple. Thanks so much, Dr. Hayward. So, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate on this uh, panel today to have uh, folks from the medical side uh, uh, in, in medical education, nursing education, and also uh, Dean Dillenberg, obviously, uh, Dean Emeritus of uh, Dental School, and Ann, uh, a, a very wide, uh, a, a, one of our nation's leading hygienists and hygienists and, and educators on a panel to hear from both sides. And I, I don't think anyone listening anymore, I'd be surprised if anyone needs to be convinced that the mouth is connected to the body and that we are a unitary health system of one, each of us. So I guess the question now becomes, why hasn't dental medical integration been, been realized yet? You know, why is it something that needs to be taught on and advocated for? Um, so I guess I'd start uh, with you, Dr. Hartnett, and, and um, Dean Dillenberg, I, I'd be pleased if, if you uh, join in uh, either during or, or after to talk about training. You know, how is, um, what have been some of the obstacles to dental medical integration in training of our medical professions, Dr. Hartnett, and of, of course, Dr. Haber. Um, and then perhaps some of the remedies you're seeing, uh, some, what are some of the things that are coming together for you? How are you, uh, what makes you optimistic? Uh, that the training will come together. And of course, Dean Dillenberg, um, uh, an expert on the training uh, and mentorship of dentists and, and really hygienists as well. Uh, I'd love to hear you uh, weigh in from the dental side on that. So uh, Dr. Hartnett. Okay. So this is something we are definitely working on. The problem is that students in healthcare professions are really being trained in silos, in their own school, in their own profession. And we are trying so hard to make this different by having interprofessional education where we bring students from different professions together. We try to put our medical, dental, nursing, and we even get pharmacy students from another school together for shared clinical experiences, case study discussions, and simulations. And the goal is for them not only to learn about oral health, but to learn to work together as a team. And we've been doing this over the, oh, past, I guess, I don't know, eight years. And some places, uh, some examples are we put a medical student and a nurse practitioner student and a dental student together in the pediatric dental clinic. And they work together with the dental resident so that they're teaching each other the medical, the nursing and the dental care for this patient to see them as a whole patient. We put midwifery students in the clinic with, in the prenatal clinic with dental students and all of the pregnant women are seen for a screening and then they're sent to the dental clinic um, after that screening. But again, they work together so that the dental students are learning more about pregnancy care and the midwifery students are learning about oral care. We. Uh, send our students together, dental students and nursing students, to senior centers, to Head Start centers. And the idea is all the same. They're learning from, with, and about each other as they learn oral health. And then we have a lot of simulations where the students can work together. There's simulation on diabetes and oral health, on Parkinson and Lewy body dementia and oral health. So we have a lot of, a lot of things in the works and and we're hoping that the students when by the time they graduate they'll really have learned not only oral health but the importance of communicating and collaborating you know, a question to, to dr hartman and dr haber who are, are both obviously involved in the program at nyu what's the reaction from students from the from say the dental side but also from the nursing side and then i'd love to hear from the patients are they surprised to see people collaborating is this 
Well, the, uh, the, the students and the faculty love it. Uh, we've published a number of studies reporting the significant change from pre-test to post-test in terms of their perception of the extent to which they've developed into professional competencies. And we use oral systemic health as the exemplar to operationalize team building and collaboration. Great. Excellent. Dr. Dillenberg, how about from the from the dental side? Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh, I, I think people who may be watching this are shocked that I've been here so quiet. It's, <laughs> but, and I tell you, it's because it's such an honor to be with the other panelists. They're rock stars. It's really something. Thank you for letting me join all of you. From this perspective, you know, uh, dentistry way back when was integrated into medical education. Harvard did it. You know, they still have medical dental students the first couple of years together. But unfortunately, our profession decided we wanted to be independent. We wanted to have our own standalone kind of practices in dentistry and sort of moved away and developed that pathway. Um, I think we realize now how important it is that we are collaborative with others. And mm -hmm. I think what NYU is doing is great. At our school, we don't have a nursing school, but our medical students, we're doing a couple things at the Arizona School of Dentistry and Oral Health that we started. And one of them is that our dental students in their fourth year spend over half the fourth year in a community health center around the United States, which is a model of medical, dental, and, and behavioral health together. So they're getting that experience while they're in their fourth year of dental school. And uh, it's the majority of the fourth year, and they love it, and it sets the stage for what they're doing next. The other thing we did, and I learned this from the University of Buffalo, uh, is that they had uh, social workers on the clinic floor uh, working in the dental school. I never heard of that until I was at a panel listening to the, <clears throat> the folks in there. I got back to Phoenix, and I called up uh, Arizona State University School of Social Work and said, hey, this is Jack. Any chance we can have a conversation? Next thing you know, I've got a social worker on our faculty. We have social work students from ASU rotating through the dental clinic. Because the thing I want the folks that are listening and watching, whether they be hygienists, dental assistants, students, or dentists, they have to understand that those social determinants of health, the issues that impact individuals beyond the critical issues that have been raised already are what are going to influence them. Not only influence them whether they come in to see health care, but influence them in terms of how they take care of themselves. And I think we need, we it's an area that we have not been uh, concerned about in dentistry, and I think we need to. So from that perspective, I think, you know, the more integration that we can have with nurses, physicians, DOs, um, and the uh, social work personnel can be big factors because to me, one of the important things that patients need to know is that we care about them. It's not just about the money that they're going to spend to get a crown or whiten their teeth or so on, but it's that they're going to a health provider that really wants to improve their health and their family's health. And to the hygienists that are watching, hats off to you because to me, you're the best health educators in the healthcare profession. And you're underutilized and under reimbursed. And I think part of this conversation, we're going to talk a little bit more about that and the opportunities, how you can be able to move forward in that. So I'll stop now. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Dean Dillenberg. You know, and let me pivot to you. I, uh, Jack teed that up, and I've been reading the comments, and we have a lot of hygienists. Uh, and, and I'm really appreciating how active they're, they're voicing their opinions. So turning it to you, We've talked a lot about this, and the science is clear, periodontal disease management is critical to so many systemic conditions. So what should the role of hygienists be? Have you seen models that you say, yeah, that's what we should be doing, or have, there, have you seen frustration point? Uh, and off I'm mute. mute. It's probably more frustration point as far as I know, but there are plenty of clinicians that are right there in the trenches doing the best that they can. I'm reading all of these comments and seeing these hygienists that are actually morphing into different areas, which I think is, is wonderful. You know, we have rules and laws and regulations and, um, and it's not universal. You know, every state is different. I 
think that as a hygienist, we do want to do more. We do do nutritional counseling. You know, it's incentivizing prevention across the board in medicine and dentistry. And that's kind of, we're more of a reactive model so often. So as prevention specialists, if we can somehow, um, everybody wants to have everything monetized, but we need to incentivize it not only for our own industry, but for their patients to have them clearly understand that prevention um, with oral health and all these other issues. I mean, I have, we have hygienists doing pathogen testing, A1C testing, um, they're, they're doing the gamut of what they can for their state. I mean, some states you can't even do lasers. So, um, policy change, you know, and I'm not one of those that jumps on all of that, but that is probably where it's going to start a little bit of policy change and understanding that this is super important. Um, everybody has to understand the importance of this to then move that forward to the, to the policymakers. That's great. Thanks, Ann. Now, Dean Dillenberg, some of the things we'll, we'll be chatting about here may sound like big things, like dental medical integration, you know, the entire healthcare system, and, uh, and some of the potential barriers and solutions may sound large, you know, technology uh, and things. But for the folks listening today, what are, I've heard you speak uh, on national policy, but I've also heard you speak to neighborhood clinicians. So no. what are some of the things people could start doing today? We have dental assistants, we have dental office managers, uh, hygienists, dentists listening today. What are some of the things that they could do that may not sound like a big idea, but could make an impact for oh. them and their patients just in their neighborhoods, you know, Great. across the country? Absolutely. And then I, I see Aaron's got a finger poking up there. So, <laughs> so I just, let me just, I'll be quick. And just, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, to me, and you hit it, that's a great thing for the hygienists, dental assistants, and, and dental team members that are out there. You know, you've got medical care providers in your communities you may not even know. One of the things I really want to encourage is reach out to them. Call up the, the nearest physician's office and, and say, hey, I'm Jack. I'm a dental hygienist in Dr. Smith's office down the street. We know you're there. We don't know what you do. We'd like you to know what we do. Why don't you come on over for a lunch and learn, and we'll pay for the pizza. You know, I think we need to reach out to our pro providers in our communities to be able to do it. That's part of the leadership skills that dentists don't realize they need it. You know, dental students don't go to dental school to learn to be leaders. They don't think they need that skill, but in reality, they do. So I think you hit on a really important point, and the opportunity exists. Reach out to the healthcare providers in your community, whether they be uh, physicians, nurses, um, and, and get together with them. Also, I think one of the things we haven't touched on yet are special needs. I think those with intellectual developmental disabilities, those with uh, elderly, I think those with special needs, you have opportunities with Special Olympics and things like that that are going on in your community. Please reach out to them. I think dentistry, just so you know, for those that may not know this, but for the Special Olympics, oral health was the first healthcare service provided to Special Olympic athletes, thanks to Steve Perlman, the pediatric dentist at Buffalo, who was friends with uh, Shriver, Eunice Shriver. She was, he was the dentist for her kid, and when she started Special Olympics, he got her to add oral health to Special Olympics. So you've got an opportunity there. So I think, Dan, that's a great point. They have an opportunity to reach out easily, and just please take advantage of that, and I think we'll see a positive outcome. Thank great. You. And, um and if, if, if you don't mind, just a personal thank you to Dr. Dillenberg. He is on, uh, he helped uh, the Pacific Dental Services Foundation open a special needs clinic in Arizona, which is not just dedicated to that patient population, but also to the education of dentists. So dentists can go in, work in real time, shoulder to shoulder with other dentists on best practices in caring for that, for that population. So Jack, just thank you. Uh, uh, for that. Uh, so Dr. Haber, if you don't mind, I'm going to pivot over to you. Jack talked about a vulnerable population and, and I'd love to continue that a little bit. Um, you're widely known as a passionate advocate uh, for our nation's elderly and uh, the expansion or inclusion of, medic of a dental benefit in Medicare. Can you, some folks may, I hate to say it, may assume that it's there, um, especially <laughs> yeah. those elderly with economic yeah. conditions. So could you share yeah. a little bit what's current state and what, it, what are you seeing? Well, 64% of adults 65 and over have no dental benefit. Very few states even have an adult Medicaid benefit. 
and there is a small proportion that are dual eligible, but it's a very small percentage. So for the majority of, of older adults, it's either pay out of pocket, try to find an affordable resource for dental care, or go without, which is unfortunately the case for a lot of older adults. And we just spoke about the link between pneumonia and morbidity and mortality. So the, the health status of the oral cavity is key to the overall health of older adults. So as a board member of the Santa Fe group, uh, which has been a leader in advocating for a, a Medicare dental benefit for older adults, uh, I'm part of a 134 organization coalition that is advocating for a medically necessary Medicare dental benefit. And that would be for those who are going to have transplants, have in end state kidney disease and need uh, kidney transplants, um, those with um, head and neck cancer, and uh, those who are on biphosphonates, which can lead to osteonecrosis of the jaw. So we are very active. The Avalier company, which is in Washington, estimates that there could be an over a $60 billion savings over 10 years if there was medically necessary um, dental benefit in Medicare. And of course, we'd like it to be broader than that because we think that the, and we, and the evidence would support including diabetics and those with cardiovascular disease and cancers other than leukemia, lymphoma is a natural, but we need a foot in the door. And, and this um, position paper we have written and legal brief that we have presented to um, the Center for Medicaid Services and Medicare Services is parallel to one that is similarly, similarly proposed by the American Dental Association. So I would say we're moving in the right direction. This is not a proposal that needs legislative action, which is a good thing in the current political climate, but rather is a a change in the Medicaid, Medicare uh, regulations that could be authorized to include this Medicare uh, medically necessary dental benefits. So we're rooting for it and we have the support of this wide array of dental, medical, nursing, social work, pharmacy organizations that are national in scope that are supporting uh, this initiative. So we are forging forward and that is the promise uh, for the future because it is essential for overall health of older adults. And AARP, and this was the focus of the last Santa Fe Salon, and then president of AARP, Alicia Georges, gave 100% support uh, to advancing uh, this initiative. And the one thing I would like to say is that our overall goal for any of these initiatives that we've spoken about, and whether it's in relation to social determinants or population health, young or old, is that we really aim to widen the lens, the overall health lens of the dental profession and the oral health lens of the medical professions, nursing, physicians, and physician assistants. And to meet in, the, in between, in our neighborhoods, as you were saying, Jack, to address the specific disparities and of older adults or younger adults or somewhere in between so that we can address those disparities and come to a whole person care success story for them. Right, excellent. And um, some of the other, um, yes, Dr. Hartnett. Yeah, I was I was going to I just saw something in the chat where someone um, said we should have a dental hygienist in the school next to the, the nurse. <laughs> and I just wanted to mention we have a program right now where we're put except of course it's on hold because of the problems with the schools, but it's a program where we have teams of nurses and dental hygienists going into the schools doing oral exam, fluoride varnish, and 
We're in 60 schools in the Bronx. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get back in them soon. But it's exactly that, like getting getting hygienists, getting nurses into the schools doing oral health exams. And then I wanted to mention um, when you were talking about special needs populations, I used to work in pediatric oncology and I started a program where we would have a dental resident to come in and see the children because these are kids you know, they're very sick, they're immunocompromised, the families have a million other issues and oral health is not on the top of their list. So if they can see a dental provider while they're there at the oncology center, it just made life so much easier for everybody and prevented a lot of problems. So that's a program that's been ongoing where there's a resident that sees all the outpatient and inpatient oncology patients now. And they work together with the nurses. Terrific. So um, it seems uh, maybe obvious or remarkable, I'm not sure which, that the issues that we're talking about seem to be manifesting most in our children and our, and our nation's most vulnerable and in the, the elderly population. Uh, and in the, in the dementia um, uh, world that you're working in quite a bit, is the, are people making this connection between, say, Medicare and the lack of the benefit? and, uh, and uh, uh, the elderly? Is that something that's actively spoken about? I, well, I do. I, we have several friends that are in, if you just take it into the nursing home and, and that, that the outcomes of these poor patients of their overall health, it is exacerbating their dementia and Alzheimer's disease without oral health. I mean, this conversation has had everywhere. Mobile dentistry is making um, such great gains in this actual arena. Um, it's giving care to this population. And, and think about this with our boomers right now. So we're going to have this climb of Alzheimer's disease and dementia is one thing, but we're about to get an onslaught of it as well um, that will be out of control. And, and getting care into these um, middle-aged and senior populations, both it is going to be so critical um, for brain health later on. That's great. You know, one of the things, uh, if I may, uh, I think the health literacy of patients is very low. There are, one of the studies uh, I remember a while back is that patients that have dental insurance, a dentist, and transportation still may not go to the dental office because they don't value it. I think this is another opportunity for dental hygienists to take advantage of their skills working with the community. Go to meetings in the community with local leaders, whether it be Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, whatever it may be to help people understand the issues that Judy's mentioned, Aaron's mentioned, Ann has mentioned relative to components of overall health that the mouth plays a significant part. You know, there are millions of Americans that just that go to a physician, just don't go to the dentist. And there are also millions of Americans that go to physicians and not dentists. It's a two-way street. We have an opportunity, again, to make this difference. And I think with hygienists as the knowledgeable educators that they are, can go out and to build up this confidence in patients that they need to go to the dentist and, and for their overall well-being. And we can get those numbers up and reduce the health literacy issue. Great. Thank you. Dr. Haber? Yes. One um, apropos of what you're saying, Jack, we, um, Aaron and I, uh, led a, an interprofessional grant with nursing and dental students at 11 senior centers in the Bronx, a largely Latino population of elders. And we taught them about their overall oral health, oral health and diabetes, oral health and nutrition. And they said to the staff at these senior centers, well, now that you've taught us all this good stuff, where are we going to get this dental care? Since most of them were on, I mean, they were all on Medicare, very few on Medicare, Medicaid, very few had Medicare Advantage plans. And so the staff talk about using the resource sources in your local community. The staff did a scavenger hunt Sweet. of affordable dental resources in their catchment area of these um, many senior centers. And they, it was a gift 
to the seniors there, and it was really a large number of them. Most, most of their dental services are just getting a toothbrush, and they're lucky if they get some, some aid in the facility to help them brush. I mean, it, it, we've got a ways to go, and I think we have opportunity now in this climate to really move the ball down the field. And so great, I, that, I mean, that's why what you guys at NYU are doing is phenomenal. And I think is a great example. And that's why it's so important for me to help you get your message out. And I appreciate what Dan and the folks at uh, uh, Procter and & Gamble and, and Oral-B are doing uh, to really get this out into the audience that's there. Please take advantage of what you're hearing and don't be afraid, don't be shy. The only silly question is the one that isn't asked. Don't be afraid to really go out there and, and take advantage of some of this, please. Right. And, you know, lest you think that this is just needs to happen on the dental side, Aaron and I nationally work with primary and acute care practices and systems, health systems, to integrate oral health in primary, acute, long-term, and home care as well. Because we have a very meaningful contribution to make to promoting the oral systemic connection and whole person care. And we need to do a better job, and that's our life's goal, right, Erin? To um, have oral health integrated as a standard component of both primary and acute care um, at every visit a patient has, whether they have diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or it's for a health promotion visit of a totally healthy person. Great. One program we've been working with is a um, nurse home visiting program. And we found that just teaching the nurses about oral health and making sure that they teach, this is the nurse family partnership and they visit pregnant moms and they stay with them until the baby is two. And they're really there to educate them. So they really weren't doing much in oral health. So we just gave them a little program and how to teach them oral health. They taught the mothers. We, we did surveys on the nurses and the mothers. And it really showed a big difference in how the mothers were caring for the babies, how much they increased up to like 85% brushing their teeth twice a day. And then when the children graduated at age two, we found there were no white spots and no brown spots. And this is a very high risk population. So it was a very simple program, just educating nurses to educate mothers and make sure that they included it in their visits. Great. So. Dean Dillenberg? You know, one of the things I just wanted to hit on real quick, and I, and I know it probably would be a question is that with all this and the new innovative technology, the telehealth, we're hearing a little bit about now, the ability to access patients. People are staying home. They're afraid. We've got issues and they don't want to get out of the house. I think telehealth, teledentistry is providing an incredible opportunity. The scanning of dental procedures in a dental office now is uh, reducing time it takes and the cost it takes to get good procedures done. You know, where I live in rural northern Arizona, the, American, the Native American population is one at great risk, as we saw with the COVID-19 numbers that emerged. And with the dental, you know, their, their dental needs, rural America is, you know, the elderly, the rural population, the American Indian population are all in need. And I think all of us on this call, whether you're speaking, listening, taking notes and looking for opportunities, they exist. You have an opportunity to make a difference. Please seize that opportunity. And you define what is the, the most meaningful one for you, whether it be in a senior center, whether it be in a rural community, whether it be in a, a Bronx middle school, you know, whatever it may be, you find your connection where you can take what you've learned and what you're going to learn more of to really improve the health of the people we serve. That's great. Thank you. So one word that's been said a few times and certainly, if not directly, then alluded to is silos, um, whether it be in the licensure, whether it be in education, whether it be in just geographic location. Uh, but there's also silos. Uh, and this, by the way, this is going to be a question for any of the panelists who want. Uh, there's a number of, of sort of large 
uh, cement walled silos, it seems, some days. It's like the payer system, you know, the pockets. When a patient goes in, depending on where they go, whether it's behavioral health or diet or vision or dental or medical or whatever, they have to think of which wallet, which whatever they, they would pay with. So the payer system. We've also got patient health history. You know, do you know if you're, you know, what you're, when your patient walks in, depending on where they walk in, do they share everything with you that would be helpful to know? So it's patient health histories and uh, there's technology, right? There's the, there's the data itself, you know, how many, uh, uh, if, if I have a, if I'm on a care team for a diabetic on the, calling in the medical world, do I know if they see the dentist and, and what happened at their last visit or is it, am I just reliant on what they tell me, you know, so just access to that shared data. So throwing those, I know it's a lot. So throwing those large institutional, if I don't, don't mind me using that word, silos, what are some of the things that, that you all are seeing uh, that give you hope or suggestions or, or, or what have you on, on, on really any of those topics? Well, I think that the electronic health record and having an interoperable, integrated electronic health record is a key to promoting collaboration yes. and will remove an enormous barrier that enables us to communicate readily with each other. Absolutely. And and it is a huge barrier that on the uh, medical side that oral health is not even a, a required field for documentation in the electronic medical record, much less having one that is integrated with dentistry. They do exist, yeah. but they are expensive and not widespread. Mm -hmm. um, but it just perpetuates the image of siloism, I, I will say. But I think it is the key to the next frontier, conquering the next frontier. Yeah. Yes, I agree. I, I agree, Judy. I think the. Uh, we need to, you know, Epic is doing that there, you know, with their medical, trying to integrate dental in there. And there's some major dental uh, uh, firms and clinics that are uh, working with that. I think you're exactly right. That That's a pathway that needs to be pursued. I think that, you know, this, epi this pandemic is now getting us to realize that we need to be sitting around the same table talking about the same things and making it easy for patients to not have to go to the emergency room. We don't want people going to the ER for toothaches. Gee whiz, look at the thousands of Americans that have to go to an emergency room because they can't get into a dental office for a toothache. And it's, it's absurd. You know? How about $1.8 billion a year? Isn't that amazing? ER visits for dentistry. That's dentistry. even more than Erin makes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, it's, I think we really have to look at that, that issue and we need the people out listening and watching now that are hearing this to get involved in your community make sure to get out and vote i'm not telling you who to vote for but make sure to get out and vote <laughs> you know for for the, the people that you believe are going to make a positive difference in our society whether it be locally community county-wide statewide or united states wide but we need to get engaged and, and, and move, make this happen, then we all win. That's great. So yeah. as far as vote, I, I will say, uh, we don't say who to vote for, but if you live in Jerome, Arizona, consider Mayor Jack <laughs> well, up for re-election. You know what was amazing? <laughs> they, they, they lowered the bar to elect me. The good yeah. news is they didn't make me limbo under it. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So, thank you for that. So um, I, I will share just a little bit of hope. Dr. Haber referred to it. You know, this access to data, you know, where uh, someone's going in, they have diabetes or they're pre-diabetic, and what the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. And if they just had that information, they never have to meet, but clinicians could start collaborating in certainly the best interest of the patient. Uh, and I know payers are interested in that. The, 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 the medical insurance company, they want that because they know that the uh, um, to, to, uh, similar data from the Avalier study that, that Dr. Haber uh, referred to, if we could have our nation's uh, uh, population with certain systemic conditions who we all know eat up 80% of the cost. If they, if they could make sure that they're getting their periodontal disease treated, um, what a remarkable impact that would have. And in the private world of insurance, they're certainly 
interested in that. So my little ray of hope is uh, I think there's an army of, of 19 to 23 year olds in their mother's basement clicking away with code and it's a, it's becoming a reality. You know, I, 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 I won't share too much, but um, with Epic, you know, I think some of you know on the Pacific Dental side, not our foundation side, but uh, we're now in offices where they have full access uh, to medical and, and dental. And the, the, the really cool thing, and this is early, but the really cool thing that's exceeded expectations, uh, uh, which are already high, is how often uh, those in the medical world are pulling the dental records into the medical, uh, just tenfold of what we predicted. And it's through no advertisement. Nobody knows. Just it's just happening organically. Once it's in there, if they have access to the data, it'll get pulled. And pharmacists are doing it as well, and like CVS health clinics, health hubs mm -hmm. and such. So it's it's this this there is hope there. I know this. Some folks in comments are saying I've been talking about this since 1991, and I totally understand. <laughs> but there is reason to 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 be optimistic. Um, not just that the science is coming through, we're seeing studies on lupus and dementia and, and others that are coming through fast and furious, but we're also seeing it on the technological enablement part. Yeah. So, and, and you know, on the payer side, there are a number of major insurance, commercial insurance companies, Aetna, Cigna, United Concordia, some of the blues um, have integrated medical dental benefit programs and every one of them for the targeted high-risk diabetic, cardiovascular, hypertensive populations, every one of them can demonstrate savings per person that amount to millions annually in terms of a cost benefit, really helping us to hit the triple aim uh, proposed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement of cost, quality, and satisfaction. It is satisfying to people to get whole per receive, be the recipients of whole person care, yeah. integrated care. Yeah. yeah, and I think for 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 some who say, hey, it ends up being the the wallet. I think there's cause for hope there, and opti realistic optimism there. That once uh, and there's studies to your point, Dr. Haber. I know there's folks listening uh, from Hawaii, and there's a great Blue Cross Blue Shield study that they did uh, in Hawaii. And there's one. I don't know if it's been published in New York yet, but a lot of us are waiting to see it. It's uh, coming. It's coming. It's been leaked. It's very positive, but I don't know. I guess yeah. we'll all wait for the yeah. study. But, waiting uh, for the final clearance from New York State. It's actually, New York State Medicaid data, right. also um, led by the Santa Fe Group. Uh, right. That's Eddie. Terrific. So, uh, you know, um, Santa Fe Group, just for folks, if you've heard anything, you can certainly put in a comment. If you'd like any more information about, you know, how to find out about any of these things, please just post in there and we'll be, we'll be happy to do it uh, for you. Uh, pivoting to some questions, if that works for you all. Uh, actually, you know what, let me, let me start with one and it'll be for, for each of you, uh, uh, a broad question. Um, we're talking about dental medical integration when our system sort of re reorganizes itself around an individual patient and clinicians are able to collaborate, right? You know, the shared data set and see each patient as a healthcare system of one. When that's realized, what does that look like? And, and, and that's as intended to be a very broad question. Um, so what are we marching towards and what, what, will, what will be realized? Uh, when that happens as quick as it can. Dr. Dr. Jack, jump in. Well, just for me, and I, I know everybody has the comment. For me, I would think it's going to emerge that dentists and physicians are going to practice in the same locations. It's not going to, the dental practice will be linked to a medical practice, just like in a community health center. We're going to see it's a health office. It's not going to be medical. It's not going to be dental. It's going to be health. And I think that's the thing that in the next 10 years we're going to see. I even thought that maybe in the next 10 decade or so, dental schools will sort of wind down a little bit and merge with medical schools. And like they did in the old days in Europe, you go to medical school and in the second year you decide you want to be a dermatologist, an oral specialist, a cardiologist, or what have you. And you'll, you'll all be physicians, but with specialties. You know, I'm tired of this doctor dentist, physician issue. I think it's healthcare. And we're, in the next 10, 20 years, 10, 20 years, we'll see. I won't be around, but that's my uh, projection. Well, we're not betting against you, Jack, but okay. I appreciate it. Others, Anne, do you have a thought? Um, yeah, we all have that perfect world that we'd yeah. like it to look like. I have always envisioned some um, dental hygiene practitioner with a nurse practitioner 
doing um, beyond what we're allowed to do um, at this point is that it is all about health care. Um, I, I know that in for dental hygienists, we have expanded duties in some states. So a lot of those hygienists with these expanded duties want to help the underserved. That is what that that's at their core and expanding those duties for hygienists um, would be great. I would love to see hygienists in. I had this dream 10 years ago to work in a cardiology practice. I, I think that all of that has to be framed a little bit differently. And of course, we have to change policy, but that it all works together. It Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Right. And they got to get reimbursed for it too. They got to get absolutely. paid. Absolutely. That's well, the thing where I think hygienists get screwed a lot. They're not getting paid for things that they want to do, could do, should do, and would be a benefit to patients if they did it. It's a shame. Right. right. Sorry. Dr. Hartnett? Yeah, I was uh, certainly go along with all of that. One thing I was thinking when Jack was saying this, the schools. You know, combining the schools, if we could just get all our healthcare schools, you know, to have to plan the curriculum together and integrating their staff instead of everybody repeating the same thing, you know, and the students could learn together and have a lot less expense, a lot, a lot less staff, and you know, and just to have people on the same calendar because that's one of the hardest things in planning the interprofessional experiences is the calendar for all the different schools. So if we all had the same calendar and we shared classes, it, it would be a lot easier. That's great. Dr. Haver? Well, I think that the first, one of the first things that needs to happen is that the dental team, dentists, dental hygienists, dental therapists, dental assistants, need to advocate for being essential members of the healthcare team, not only in times of pandemic or disaster, but at all times. They have so many valuable contributions, yes. competencies to add to the um, to the whole person care of a people, whether in primary or acute or long-term care settings, that this silo has got to be broken down and they have to engage as essential healthcare workers. And I think that will set the stage for the whole reimbursement uh, that you mentioned, Jack, and moving towards a diagnostic code system rather than a procedure system so that we are all singing on out of the same page of the hymn book and, and I, I think that is pretty important um, as we think about how to envision uh, the future that's excellent thank you all so um, we're going to start answering some of the questions that have been posted i do want to note that the verification code is pds panel which Thank you, Jed, that's Pacific Dental Services. Could you fit in the word foundation? That would be great. But PDS <laughs> panel, terrific. Yeah, sorry about that. I wondered if I should have used that one. No, oh, that's terrific. So questions. Um, Jack, if, if I can start with you, Dean Dillberg. Um, yeah. The oral, when COVID hit, right, a lot of dental practices, and if you listen to Marco at the ADA, I think it was 90 six percent plus is the best he could do uh, apologies marco if i'm budging that a little uh, of dental practices all but closed uh, and 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 there were there were only some that were able to really pivot and and be able to serve emergency patients um, and one of the things that persuaded policymakers to open up um it was the oral systemic link that it's not just hey it's Absolutely. not about getting teeth whitening here that's not what we're talking about and why the dental offices need to stay open and i know that you and 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 dr georges benjamin uh, uh on the medical side and others were uh great advocates for this part of i think i mentioned early on the that hashtag dental er campaign that really caught fire so thank you but what role did you see when in your active conversations uh there what role does did oral systemic health play in, in COVID? And, in, well, I think, you know, the, the important thing is, you know, there was a misconception that dental offices weren't safe because of the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, 
spray from drills and everything, which proved to be nonsense. And that's why I love that the Georges Benjamin, for those who don't know, Dr. Georges Benjamin was to be the health commissioner for uh, Delaware, Washington, D.C. He's the executive director of the American Public Health Association. He's the highest ranking public health uh, physician. And we were friends. And, and with Dan's <laughs> guidance, uh, we were able to put together a 90 second video. It was so hysterical. And, and the two of us were able to do this and send it to all the governors and policymakers. And then all of a sudden it got a lot of traction. And we talked about it. And George's was outstanding to recognize. He realizes how important oral health is to overall health. And I think and that dental offices are safe. Dental, I mean, dentists have been, and hygienists have been taking care of uh, uh, sterilization, sanitation since day one. So I think the, the, once the reality got out that dental offices, in fact, are safe, and that there were no cases transmitted. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of dental visits since January when all this started uh, shutting down dental offices, and there was no transmission of COVID-19. So I think the evidence supported it. And, and I was so appreciative to George's that the physicians recognize that dental is necessary, as we've heard from our colleagues on the panel today, and it's safe. And they need, people need to know that. Yeah, thank that's you. great. So thank you for your work on that. I know uh, uh, millions of patients, and that's not an exaggeration, benefited by all of that great work. So thank you. So uh, um, panelist questions from attendees. Uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Haber, first want to just popped up and I'll check on the other ones is uh, Santa Fe group. It's been mentioned. Uh, people are wondering what, what's the Santa Fe group. The Santa Fe group, which I could have and should have mentioned in de greater detail before is an oral health advocacy and policy think tank um, that is largely membered by dentists, but also physicians, myself, nurse practitioner, um, others who are policy experts. And we advocate for improving lives through promoting oral health as a key component of overall health. And we are involved in promoting medical dental integration. We're instrumental in the original oral cancer campaign. And, and now, um, and for several years, advancing the Medicare dental uh, benefit. And we are also involved in sponsoring salons uh, we'll be having one next fall on medical dental integration, surprise, <laughs> which will also have a big focus on COVID-19. Great. Thank you for so that. That's what it is. Great. Uh, a question from uh, Dr. Glick, and thanks for asking it, Dr. Glick. Uh, mm -hmm. He wanted you, Jack, to clarify a comment on dental is safe and on aerosol, uh, that aerosol is, did you mean they're not, a, that aerosol is not a risk, or did you mean that that dental practices know how to mitigate. The man, I think dental, uh, thanks. Uh, that's uh, Dr. Glick. Oh my God. That's it. <laughs> he used to work for me. We would know. He's an old friend. You know, <laughs> aerosols are, you know, dental offices are, are, are mitigating them. They're managing them. They're now in a dental office uh, than being in some restaurant where uh, people are speaking and you know whatever and cheering and, or or the Sturges motorcycle rally or something to me is a lot more dangerous than going to a dental office so yes the uh i think they've been managing the aerosol they have to be managed but we have, we're not seeing them causing any transmission that's the thing there 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 have not been cases though aerosols are potentially uh an issue so i appreciate that dr glick thank you great uh there's a question about teledentistry uh, thank you, Marie. How can teledentistry help to increase dent help increase dentist reach and, and allow dentists to see more patients? Don't we ultimately need to have patients come into the clinic? So, really open question on teledentistry. How can that help access? Well, a lot of things. I think uh, if if we do the teledentistry in a rural population and the patient only needs a cleaning, uh, then maybe the hygienist can go out and do a profi. Instead of the patient coming all the way into the dental office just to find out they don't have any issues except they just need a profi or something like that. So I think that's one thing. And, and it could screen the patient before going into the dental office to see if there are any issues that need to be addressed before going to the dental office to make it a safer, more productive visit. 
That's great. I, I've seen, uh, uh, personally, I've seen teledental be very helpful during certainly initial COVID where patients wanted to know, should I come in? You know, is this something that I should come into the dentist for? How do I do my own personal risk uh, reward uh, 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 balance? And that was helpful. And another one rather unusual uh, that I saw that was really cool was they split screen. So it was the GP dentist with a specialist. So the patient could literally get a warm handoff to a specialist and they could share data. And the GP dentist was saying, you know, Mary, I'd like you to meet, this is the periodontist. And this is what, a, you know, and the periodontist was able to, instead of just writing down their name and sending them off to an oral surgeon or what it would be, they actually introduced them in real time. And for the patient, I think that was remarkably comforting uh, and, and made for a, a very tr um, warm handoff, if that makes sense. Uh, Anne? Can, yeah, I want to say something a little bit about uh, teledentistry. And I know that for hygienists, Colorado is a very lovely state with their teledentistry, and it's wonderful. Um, that is something that policy, that would be super important for policy change, is that that is, it is not a gray area. It's going to be black and white and hopefully err on the side of the, the part that we get to do it, um, that each state needs to be um, understanding how important this is. There was something that came out um, about a month ago about a poor patient who um, dentistry was closed down. Um, long story short, it was an oral cancer situation. By the time he came back in four months, it was horrible. The situation is grave at this point. And as simple as this telemedicine, teledentistry, if somebody could have just shot a photo of it and then moved him on to a, a physician could have changed this person's life. So I think this telemedicine, teledentistry is going to be, that's one of our, our critical areas for so much education and, and all the rest. Yeah, and I, I had seen a, a, a study, and this is dated information. This has got to be, apologies, seven years ago, where there were places, I think it was North Carolina, just the way the state's configured, that there were patients who uh, didn't have a dental practice within 75 miles. So I think sometimes when we think rural, we think some of our larger states, but it, uh, it really is a national issue. Uh, Dr. Haber, I think, um, but key to what you're saying, Anne, and this could needs to occur, these are policy changes related to reimbursement that need to occur at the state and or federal level. So, for example, on the medical side of life during the pandemic, CMS and other payers follow CMS, they eliminated the barriers related to telehealth telemedicine by reimbursing for those visits at the same rate as a face-to-face -face visit. And that jacked up the telehealth telemedicine visits by millions. I mean, NYU was doing 5,000 a day from a very small number to 5,000 a day. And that was because there was an incentive, as we mentioned earlier, to change and be futuristic about how we practice. And it's very satisfying for a lot of patients for a lot of situations um, where you don't need an in-person visit or it's a precursor to, but practitioners, clinicians, professionals need to be paid for it in an equitable way. Right. So we'll see if those waivers continue um, when the pandemic ends, whenever that is. There's also a question uh, that says uh, dentists give, uh, certainly do injections, uh, likely on a daily basis in the mouth. Why are they not, uh, does their scope of licensure cover vaccines and other injections? And it's I'll add a comment, I'll add a comment. Pharmacists were just approved um, to give uh, vaccinations. So why pharmacists? I well, agree. It, it, not to be cynical, but we love our pharmacists. But why would a pharmacist be approved and not a I dentist uh, to do it? It's ridiculous. I got my flu shot last week at my Walgreens. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And I think and, and to the HPV we talked about, I think here's something that can be administered at a dental setting, presented as a cancer preventative, not necessarily dealing with the sexual behavior, which is what I think a lot of parents got turned off about okay. when they heard about but I think we have an opportunity, but you're hundred percent right. Dentists get more injection in a week than a pharmacist does in a year. Yeah. And uh, it, 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 
for those, and I, this has been a great call as far as uh, trying to catalyze activity and encouraging folks in their their local community or, or state or national to get involved. There is a lesson to be learned, perhaps, from the pharmacy world. You know, they catalyzed and, and they went after it. And uh, I know the American Dental Association is active here. The, the Association of Dental Support Organizations is active here and a lot of uh, leading academics in dental. But it, it takes a bit of a groundswell uh, to do sometimes to get done what is common sense. But uh, yeah. I would encourage folks uh, to lean yep. in. And I love the, no, the new ADSO uh, organization for, uh, with the uh, dealing with the dental service organizations. Their new leadership was named Brett. Emmett. Brett. He is a rock star and he's got some great ideas. And for those of you who are working in DSOs, take advantage of learning more about the ADSO. They're really doing amazing work. Good to hear. Thanks. Uh, other questions? Um, I think we did a pretty good job getting to them, actually. And I got to compliment this panel at 1015. I was clocking you. Stop, transition to questions, and we actually uh, just have about a minute left. So I'm going to remind folks the verification code is PDS panel. Um, so please go to cezoom.com, click on that green verify button that, yes, I'm me, and I listened, and then hit the uh, PDS panel. Uh, which is your, uh, type that in, which is your verification code. And last, let me thank again, of course, Crest Oral-B. I really appreciate them, uh, Jed and Sarah, uh, for today and really for promoting oral systemic health. It's important. And uh, for our panelists, thank you for bring, letting us into your kitchens, your home offices, and your man minds. Uh, oh, if you haven't seen Dr. Jack's man mind, trust me. Uh, <laughs> Jed, trust me. Um, it's good. I'll, I'll tease him with this, Jack. Do you mind? If, no. if Anyone who has a photo of Mother Teresa and Bob Marley, amongst others, on their wall and has a compelling personal story about each is someone you have to spend some time wow. with. Wow. <laughs> but it's, it's been, thank you so much, and Thank you, panelists. It's been such an honor. Judy, Aaron, and you guys are awesome. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege. Keep up the great work. Whatever I can do to help. You guys, it's a real treat. And thank you again, everyone, and all the folks in the audience listening. Thank you so very much. Great. Thank you. Yeah, this has been a great you. opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Anne, Dan, Jack. Very nice to meet Jed. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thanks, Jed. Back to my man, Mike. Okay. That's a wrap. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.